<clears throat> hey, this is Bruce and welcome to the three-part series on basic telecommunications. What I'm going to share with you is are three different segments, three different ten-minute segments um, that constitute the chalk talks that I use when I teach basic and advanced telecommunications at AT&T. Segment number one is the basics of how a telephone works. Segment number two is how we digitize that voice channel. And segment number three is how we multiplex or get several voice channels onto the same pair of wires or fiber. So let's start with segment number one is the basics of how telephones work. And let me start this conversation by asking you, how many of you guys know how a telephone works? Now I'm not asking you if you know how to use a telephone because we all know you pick up the handset, you dial your number and then the magic happens. You, you get a connection. You see, I never fail to be amazed how many people, like me, started using telephones from the time I could talk. But yet, so few of us actually know how they work. Well, this is magical, and, and, and this is the magic I want to share with you today. So let's go back 130 some odd years to the day of Alexander Graham Bell. And my hat's off, cheers to Alexander Graham Bell. He changed the world. Uh, in terms of communication. See, I have to believe that this whole idea of a telephone <clears throat> started with one big aha moment, one realization on the part of Alexander Graham Bell, and that realization is what made the telephone possible. And here's that aha. Sound doesn't exist the way we typically think it does. What I mean by that is there is no sound right now between my mouth and your ears. There's a mechanical disturbance of air, but that's it. You see, in our context, a lot of people might argue with me that sound waves and sound are the same thing, but in our context, in the world of telecommunications, they're very different things. And what I mean by that is, <clears throat> I take in a, a breath of air, contract the diaphragm, push air across the vocal cords, and depending on the, the stress, that I put on the vocal cords, the strain, I can cause the air passing through the vocal cords to vibrate at different frequencies. That air passes through the mouth and the continually variable structure of the mouth that, that we as humans have allows me to continually change even further the way that air vibrates. Uh, a musician, a, a wind instrument, or a, a vocalist might refer to that as the embouchure of the mouth. So as the vibrating air passes through the mouth, it gets vibrated in even greater, uh, uh, more funky ways. I'm sure if we could see that, it would be fascinating. <clears throat> so what we produce is a mechanical disturbance of air. So when I clap my hands, it causes a mechanical disturbance of air waves. Those air waves pass across the room. Let me see if I can't diagram this for you. These <clears throat> air waves pass across the room in whatever pattern they come out of your mouth or whatever sound comes out of, uh, of clapping. They pass into your ear, into the ear canal, and as it passes into the ear canal, which is sort of a funnel, which gives it a magnifying effect, as it goes further and further down the funnel, it magnifies those air waves. It will get to the end to the eardrum. Now on that eardrum are many little fibers, hair-like fibers known as cilia. On the other side of the eardrum, those cilia are connected to nerves that go up to the brain. <clears throat> when those fluctuating patterns, those vibrations, those those nerve senses get to the brain, the brain looks for patterns. For example, the vowels, A, E, I, O, U, each are, have their own pattern of vibrating the air. So as those patterns hit the eardrum and the nerves send those to the, uh, the cerebral cortex of the brain, the brain starts to interpret, look for patterns, anything that looks like A, E, I, O, U, or that particular pattern, at that point, the brain makes an interpretation, and that, in my opinion, is where sound starts. 
What we do is we just disturb the air. This is the aha that gave Alexander Graham Bell the ability to create a telephone. Now, in order to take that a step further, let's go ahead and take apart a telephone. You need three or four basic parts or elements for a telephone. First of all, you need a microphone, you need a speaker, you need a wire or medium of some sort, and you need electricity. I use, you've seen these before, I use this telephone not because it's, it's functionally different in any way, but because it's easy to take apart. This is the microphone. Let me see if I can get it up here in a way that you can see. If you look inside there, what you'll notice is there's a little shiny sheet, which is actually a little plastic bag of sorts. Now inside that plastic bag is a carbon wafer. <clears throat> This is a carbon microphone. There are many different types of microphone. Carbon microphones are just one, one type. Now carbon has an interesting set of qualities. One of the qualities is that it's a pretty darn good conductor of electricity. Take that a step further, the tighter those carbon molecules are compressed together, the better conductor it is, the more electricity it will conduct. So what happens is, in a telephone, we have a basic flow of electricity going into this carbon microphone. We take the fluctuating air current coming from <clears throat> your mouth or a, a clap or, or any sort of a sound. That vibrating air current hits that little plastic bag and in very minute, minute ways, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you, very minute, minute ways, it is compressing that carbon wafer. What happens when it compresses the carbon wafer? What happens to that steady flow of electricity? Well, the variable conductivity of the wafer causes that electrical current to fluctuate. To the exact same pattern as the vibrating airwaves hitting it. I have just taken, in the Alexander Graham Bell discovered this over 130 years ago, I have taken a mechanical disturbance of air and changed it into fluctuating electrical current. That's the function of a telephone on the transmitting end. If I look at the receiving end, I need a speaker. You've seen these before. I've got a, a magnet, a cone, and inside that cone I have a little magnetic uh, uh, element. As the fluctuating electrical current goes into that magnet, it changes the magnetic force, which will pull this cone in and out to the exact same pattern of the fluctuating electrical current. As it moves that cone in and out, it's vibrating the air, interestingly enough, in an exact same way as the fluctuating air current going in. This is the function of a telephone. Now, let me add one more element before I let you go. This copper wire is only good for a certain distance. Copper will actually absorb some of the electricity as it goes along. What happens is somewhere around three, four, five thousand feet, it's going to bleed off this electrical current. So what I've got to do is as the electrical current starts to lose power on the telephone wires out in the network, I'm going to put an amplifier. That amplifier is going to add to the current and send it another three, four thousand feet. What you'll find in the network is every three or four thousand feet on an analog copper telephone line, you'll find these amplifiers. This is how a telephone works. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, uh, has the magic been ruined? I don't think so. Now, you can fascinate your, your friends and family. I, I, maybe I would suggest against talking about this stuff at a cocktail party. People tend to move away from you. But that's it. I'll see you for part two.